Chapter 4, Super Athlete, Hashtagger. Maggie Mercury just didn't get it. Nobody went to a lacrosse game to watch the cheerleaders. When it came to sports, I was the authority, not any pom-pom girl. Not only was I the star midi at lax, but I also quarterbacked the football team. At wrestling, I didn't hold any specific role. I was just a beast. So when Megan came to me in full freakout mode, blubbering about some dude named Noah who wanted to join the cheerleaders, I had so much chill out, Megan. I mean, stinks to be you, but what am I supposed to do about it? Till I got a load of this. You kill us, kid, at the Big Pack Rally. We held it in the cafeteria because there was still no gym. Coach Franco introduced the team first. The players got a pretty good ovation, especially me. Then the cheerleaders came out. There was the standard hooting mixed with the usual buzzing of a few idiots who barely knew what they were there for. Noah came on last. I had seen plenty of guide cheerleaders. Trust me, this was different. It was impossible to come up with only one word to describe the kid. He was like a dweeb shrimp goober stick bug klutz. When he first shambled out, total silence greeted his arrival. Then, as the crowd began to realize that they were actually seeing what they thought they were seeing, a wave of laughter and cheers began to rise. Thinking this was a welcoming ovation, Noah took a deep bow, honking his head on her team flagpole, knocking it over into the front row of seats, kids scattering in all directions. Thinking it was a welcoming ovation, Noah took a deep bow, honking his head on the team flagpole, knocking it over in the front rows. Kids scattered in all directions. Now, Noah did get an ovation, a standing one. People were practically losing their minds and screaming their heads off. I thought back to Megan's word. Believe me, hashtag. No one's going to notice that there's a team on the field once this train wreck gets going. She was right. Here we were, center stage in our own cafeteria, in front of our own fans, and nobody was even looking at us. All eyes were on the train wreck, who was jumping around like someone had put 10,000 volts through him, waving to the crowd with one hand and holding his rapidly welling forehead with the other. If this kid stayed on the cheerleading squad, this wouldn't be a lacrosse season. It would be a sketch on Saturday Night Live. In sports, if you're not respected, you can't be feared. And it's impossible to be feared if your opponents are too busy laughing at the dweeb, shrimp, goober, stick bud, klutz, and the cheerleading squad. So I made a mental note to have a little conversation with this Eukilis kid to discuss his cheerleading future and the fact that he was going, not going to have one. At first, I stalked the girls' locker room because that's where the cheerleaders change. Megan set me straight when she came out of her street clothes. Of course he doesn't dress in here with us. He's in the guys' locker room. That was even worse. He was meant to be with the team. Not only would we be stuck with him on the field. Every game would start with a little preview of dweeb shrimp, goober stick, bud klutz. No one would be able to pay attention to Coach Franco. I was more convinced than ever that Eukilis had to go for the good of the Hornets. So I waited outside the guys' room. Five minutes, then 10. No dweeb shrimp, goober stick, bud klutz. Finally, I decided I'd better go, just in case he flushed himself down the toilet and needed a lifeguard. He was there all right, running around in his underwear, peering into lockers and bins. What's the problem, I asked him. Oh, hi, he said to me. You wouldn't happen to know where my pants are, would you? I looked up and there they were, right where I expected them to be, draped over the blades of ceiling fan, turning slowly. I reached up, grabbed a dangling lead, pulled them down, and tossed them to their owner. Get dressed, I told them, looking away, because those pale skinny legs are burning my eyes. We have to talk about how you don't want to be a cheerleader anymore. <gasps> but I do, he exclaimed, stepping into his jeans, and then out again so we could put them on right, the right way. It's the least I can do to be true to my school. He must have been a great actor because I could have sworn he was sincere. All right, kid, I'm not brain dead. What are you trying to prove? Proof, he frowned. You can prove a mathematical equation by demonstrating it holds true for any of the domain of numbers, but I don't see how that concept applies to cheerleading. My eyes narrowed. What are you, a wise guy? I used to be, he admitted. I'm an average student now. I might even get to take remedial classes. I breathed a silent apology to Megan. 
Noah Eucalyptus was the most annoying person who ever stumbled across the face of the earth. He was obviously messing with me, calling me stupid or something. I didn't take that from anybody. I grabbed him under the arms and lifted him off the floor. I couldn't help noticing that both of his feet were sticking out of one pant leg. The clown had the nerve to insult me. Captain of three sports teams? Hang up your pom-poms, little man, I told him. You're done. And I walked out of there, leaving him to find his second pant leg all by himself. Before the door eased it shut behind me, I heard him say, There are no loops to hang them by. It's a design flaw. The next day, when I jogged out into the field for lax practice, I glanced over to the sidelines where the cheerleaders were working out, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Noah. I thought I'd been speaking English yesterday, not Swahili. I'd made my message 1,000% clear. Megan shot me an accusing look, like I'd epically failed at my assignment. Actually, she was right. I ran over, pulled them out of formation, and hissed, What are you doing here? He beamed at me and held out one of his pom-poms. Look, I've installed the loop of elastic fabric affixed with industrial staples so it could hang from any peg or hook. I told the girls it was your idea. He tried to wink, but he couldn't get that right, blinking both eyes. I swear I just stood there with my mouth hanging open. I might still be there if Coach Franco hadn't blown his whistle to get started. Practice was terrible. The other players were okay, but I just couldn't get my act together. It's impossible to throw and catch with a lax stick unless your head's in the game. And I was off. All the guys were off. Because every play went through me at some point. Coach Franco practically passed out from blowing his whistle so often. He had a lot of suggestions about what we needed to do to improve. I didn't listen to any of them. I knew that what really needed to improve was the Uchilla situation. I kept an eye out for Noah around school, stalking out his locker, cornering him at the lunchroom. You haven't quit yet? This better be because you got laryngitis and you've got no voice to tell Megan the bad news. Oh no, my voice is exemplary, he replied cheerfully. A fine thing that would be, a cheerleader who can't cheer. That's what I'm trying to tell you, I insisted. You can't cheer. It's over. On the contrary, the season hasn't even started yet. Listen, man, this is a cheerleading squad, not including you. You're not on it. Certainly I'm on it. I'll show you I'm on the list. I know you're on it, but you're off it. That, he informed me, is logically in possibility. I was getting more ticked off every day, and so was Megan. Not at him, at me. I don't want to be negative, but he's ruining our routines. She was trying to remain calm, but I could sense her anger crackling under the surface. When everybody else turns left, he turns right. We're in a tight formation, and he's all over the place. He measured our human pyramid with a protractor. He translated our fight song into Latin. You've got to do something. So how's that my problem? I shot back. You're the head cheerleader. Kick him off the squad. Miss Taurus won't let me. She says he has more school spirit than the rest of us put together. And for some reason, she's protecting him. Protecting him, I echoed. He doesn't need protection. The kid's an alien sent down from the mothership to drive everybody crazy. We need protection from him. Oh, come on, she exploded. Some tough guy you are. Stop giving the guy supernatural powers. He's not an alien. He's just a plain clueless. Stop being so subtle. You're going to have to get right in his face and tell him how it is. I agonized over that. Noah Eucalyptus had become almost an obsession. He was so far inside my head that I couldn't do the things in the cross field that were practically second nature to me. I saw his eager goofball grin in my sleep. Was it possible that he wasn't evil at all? That he simply didn't understand what I was telling him? The more I thought about it, the more sense it made. You couldn't lean on a guy who barely had the sense to notice he was being leaned on. I had to threaten him, pure and simple. I already told him to quit the cheerleaders. What I hadn't said was quit the cheerleaders or else. Two extra words that made all the difference. It would be an ugly scene, but it'd be worth it. Eukilis would be gone once and for all, and then the Hornets could get back to lacrosse. But I couldn't risk confronting him at school. There was too great a chance of being overheard by one of the teachers. Coach Franco had a zero tolerance policy on bullying. If you got caught, you were off the team. Even if you were only doing it out of team spirit. No, this had to be done outside of school. Hardcastle was a small town. Noah couldn't hide forever.